So, hi, I'm Mog Morgan uh, for the Egyptian Magic Podcast uh, and doing a recording for the Thelemic Symposium. And I'm talking today to Kavan McLaughlin. Hope I got that right. Yep. Uh, Kavan, but yeah, McLaughlin, you got bang on. Well done. Okay, so Kavan McLaughlin. Uh, who is uh, one of the speakers in the formal session, the keynote speakers, I think, uh, on the topic of the best of all possible will. So before we kind of go into that a little bit, uh, what you're going to do, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, what you do and who you are, <laughs> you know, the usual things? Yeah, I'm a, a, a senior lecturer at uh, the University of the West of, of England. Um, I lecture in, well, it's media and communication. Uh, it should be media communication and cultural studies, but the cultural studies aspect uh, is is there in content, but not in name. Uh, and one, one may wonder if that's because cultural studies as a project is explicitly political, but I very much cultural studies is my interest and so in terms of my research my specialisms in all culture and how that kind of intersects with cultural studies um i'm also a digital artist a creative media practitioner is the term i use so i'm primarily a filmmaker uh do a lot of video art music video uh things of that nature but i also produce sort of digital art websites uh you know any kind of kind of media uh that i can work creatively in um uh, and, and a practicing magician as well of course so it's my... okay how did you how did you, you uh, get in that's the bit that gets me going how did you first get into magic then what's led you into that path yeah so i've spoken about this before i had a slightly different because i feel like Almost every person I speak to in the scene was reading Crowley in a library as a teenager <laughs> or something, which wasn't which wasn't my inroad because I was raised Irish Catholic um, and quite quite you know had quite Irish Catholicism is very strict, so I was terrified of all these things when I was younger. In fact, I have a memory of being in the role playing club and someone bringing in the I Ching when I was a teenager and me being actually frightened that sort of like playing with that might be dangerous. You know, uh, uh, I was I was the jump onto your bed because the devil literally might be under there and will could grab you sort of person. So it was later in life, actually, where I I was at university and I was having troubles with um, anxiety and depression. Uh, I've been having very bad issues like that since I was a teenager. Um, and someone introduced me to the work of Robert Anton Wilson. Wow. And I read The Cosmic Trigger. And in The Cosmic Trigger, when he mentions some of the kind of uh, uh, experiments that he'd been doing that Crowley suggested around um, language, uh, and, you know, in the Crowley version, there's the sort of slashing yourself with a razor blade when you uh <laughs> when you when you misstep which i remember uh, robert anton wilson thought was a bit severe and had swapped for uh, an elastic band uh, and i've always been sort of an experimentalist uh you know interested in uh finding out for myself the, the validity of things and so when i was presented with these sort of techniques and experimental techniques and things and i was like oh well, I wonder what would happen if you did that. And so I engaged in a series of experiments where I made um, a really conscious effort to adapt my language, particularly around um, negative self-talk, but also around um, overly reified concretizing absolutes in my language, which were like seen to be self-limiting and things like that. Can you explain but, that, uh, that last bit? Yeah. Overly, overly, you have to do it again, go on. No, that's okay. I yeah. mean, uh, so uh, Robert Anton Wilson was very interested in, uh, uh, you know, this thing about E prime, uh, which is a language system wherein uh, uh, if, if if something's defined, uh, so so if you say that something is something, mm. uh, uh, it's a very kind of absolutist 
uh, uh, position to take, and Robert Anton Wilson was much more interested in ambiguity and uh, was a, a multi-model agnostic. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, he ascribed to multi-model agnosticism, and was very interested in the value of being able to retain different kinds of um, possibilities and fluidity and ambiguity in one's thinking. Uh, and so Ibram is just one example of like stating that something emphatically is something uh, is is a very definitive way of speaking. Uh, and, and I found that sort of very interesting and had some awareness of that because I was very argumentative. I was very uh, a strong debater and I could have quite views on things. And I saw a lot of wisdom in that. And I saw that being able to um, it's, so there were just lots of different examples that I wrote out for myself about things that I ought not to say, like I ought not to tell people. Very often we catch, or, catch ourselves saying things like, you should do X, Y, and Z to other people. And I'm an anarchist and I, and I, and, and I believe in like people's sort of, sort of personal sovereignty and stuff like that. And I was like, I ought not to be going around telling people what they should do. I need to try and adapt my language and try and find different ways of saying it. Like what I found very useful for me and might be applicable to you is, or so on and so forth. So I just had lots of, I literally wrote them down in a book. I'm like, oh, here's something that I don't want to say. I don't want to categorically say something definitively is a certain way or that people should be doing a certain thing. And I certainly don't want to be saying things like, I'm awful, I'm terrible, people hate me, I'm so bad, you know, because I was aware that that um, was feeding into low self-esteem and stuff like that. So I just wrote down a list of different things that I didn't want to say, and I had my little elastic band around my, my wrist, and if I caught myself saying them, I, gave myself the thwap and whatever, and I, I made a really concerted effort to uh, change the actual language that I use. And I had a transformative experience where not only did it actually change my kind of view of myself, I initially started doing it in a kind of playful way. I had to do it ironically. So if I was going to say only positive things about myself, I didn't really believe them internally, but I just started using the words and so I do them ironically initially. And it just started actually changing my, not just my mood, but how people were responding to me. It changed my relationships and it ended up like totally transforming my entire life. And I was like, okay, well, if this technique worked, I wonder like he says, you can do this maybe and have that visionary experience or contact that entity. Maybe I should start experimenting with that too. And then, so I fell down the rabbit hole that way. So it kind of your initial fear of the occult which mm. comes from your kind of background, I suppose, um, <laughs> from from the church, maybe that. So did you tackled that using these techniques, and it kind of in the end it just went. So my initial fear, you know, there was a lot of I was very heavily culturally programmed. And so a lot of that continued for a while. And I had to, I had to not just with those techniques, but in other ways, confront those things. Um, and it, and it, and it kind of became a kind of guardian at the threshold type thing that when I passed through certain experiences or I allowed myself to confront certain things, I came out the other side of it and realized that it wasn't the thing that I initially thought it was. Um, and so in transforming my relationship with certain symbols or entities or ideas, I so too was transformed and it became clear to me that this was part of, uh, that my anarchism was bridging out into a spiritual anarchism and this was a, 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 a related to different forms of personal liberation. Yeah. I kind of, listening to that, I kind of, what sprung to mind is, uh, I think it's a phrase from Crowley where he says a curse on because, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you might be familiar with. Is that that's the kind of thing you? That's an explanation of that, really. That yeah, it, indeed, it might be cause or in our language, a kind of a sort of conditioning thing. If you're not careful, you you get into this always having to find an explanation for things. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 it's. 
it's this awareness that I had from the youngest possible age where I was walking around in the world deeply concerned with authority and power and how it was misused or it seemed to be misused all around me. And I was aware of the sort of, uh, if, if you want to put it in magical terms, you know, the the spells that people were weaving, or if you want to put it in psychological terms, you know, the cultural programming that was that was being used. Uh, that 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 you know you have uh, Philip K. Dick's Black Iron Prison or 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 William Blake's Mind Forge Manacles. That the the extent to which people are unaware of how much of what they're doing is socially conditioned and pre-programmed, uh, and I just had an aversion to that from my earliest possible memory. I was like, I don't want anyone else <laughs> deciding uh, <laughs> how I'm going to be or act or respond in any given situation i want to be the person in charge um uh and so that became sort of uh interwoven with my relationship with sort of magical practice so when you say magical practice so did you go on from that and get involved with it you know the full-blown sorcery and all the stuff that's in Foley, I'm not so familiar with the stuff in Robert Anton Wilson, but the actual, you know, operational magic and great big rituals. Or yeah, so Bob very, very, very affected by Crowley, mm. uh, hugely influenced by Crowley. Um, so, uh, excellent question. My initial after I, uh, you know, the cosmic trigger was in fact pulled for me by the cosmic trigger. I, uh, the stuff that I was immediately interested in was the stuff that, uh, that, that spoke to me early on was the chaos magic stuff, uh, was the first sort of things I read. And, and I remember getting a copy of like Simon's Necronomicon or whatever, because we all <laughs> loved HP Lovecraft, but I found the chaos magic stuff, the most interesting initially um but then after a few years of sort of being very into that and being quite eclectic and sort of creating a lot of my own stuff um as 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 one does in the chaos magic milieu i also noted this idea that p carroll had put forward of um really really investing in a system completely and utterly until you get results from that system and then fucking it off and then completely investing in something utterly different and sort of seeing and getting an understanding of the meta processes that go underneath. And I was like, okay, so I should do that. So I should, there's, there's other pre I'd already been reading heavily around and I was like, well, there are other sort of pretty solid, well-considered pre-existing systems. So I should really fully engage in that. The issue that I had was I'm not okay with hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of logic. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you picked that up already. All oh, right, maybe uh, surprising me. <laughs> so, so I, so I had some concerns around that, and I also had concerns around oaths of secrecy, mm -hmm. um, because again, part of my always having had these anarchistic tendencies from go. Uh, meant that I would never join a group where there was an implicit hierarchy where there was going to be someone above me that I couldn't respect. I wasn't going to be okay with that. And I wasn't going to take an oath of secrecy um, because I believe in the democratization of these things. If they, if, if the techniques and practices in the magical milieu are actually empowering, I have a problem with people. I understand, I understand processes of introducing people to things for their protection and safety but that's not all we come across in our culture we also come across elitism and people like trying to withhold things for reasons of power and dominance and i was always a little bit snooty about that and i was a little bit snooty about how some of these groups had a relationship with you know um so for example uh masonry and its association with again power and aristocracy and things like that i have a little bit of a dislike and distrust of but i finally uh came across um it wasn't actually sam's 
or order. It wasn't actually an open source order of the Golden Dawn, but it was another lodge that had used the open source order of the Golden Dawn's materials because they were open source, um, and they were uh, they were uh, you know they were put together. They were non hierarchical, and they the only oath they made you take there was to keep things sacred, not to keep things secret. And so then I could engage in that. So I did do the kind of open source thing, although that one has the lemma woven through it. So it's not just, it's not the, uh, uh, so I did that. And I also engaged with um, the Horace Matt Lodge because mm. that, that of course fits with my particular uh, <laughs> issues <laughs> that I have. Um, you know, and so there was a few things like that where I, did go and I went through systems. And then I also had a look at the AA curriculum and I worked through a lot of that. Okay. Uh, and then eventually came back full circle to probably, I, I, I've also done a lot of things like, uh, uh, you know, I went full into the yoga thing for a while. I was pretty much a yogi for a year as like a full-time thing. And I've been a long-term Vipassana meditator. So I've done lots of different things until I finally come back round to my own eclectic blend and mix of me and my practice. Okay. Well, I ask everybody this. What, what do you, having gone on that journey, what, what do you think of um, Alistair Crowley now then? What's your take on him or your general assessment? Yeah, so I'm. I, I I watched a couple of your other interviews. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed Angela's answer to this. I think I'm in. The, I mean, I think there's no question that the guy was um, uh, incredible in lots of ways. It just the 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 uh, the scale of his achievements, um, how much of a polymath he was, how how genuinely talented, how how complex and multivalenced and layered his writing is and the sheer body of work that he produced, uh, utterly incredible. I wouldn't let him look after my daughter. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I, I'd be thoughtful about what parties I invited him to. I'd invite him to some and not others. So, you know, I had some question marks over him as a character, um, but an incredibly important figure. And particularly with respect to and I think I recall this is something Angela mentioned as well in reference to what I said about what I believe about the democratization of magic. I think some of the stuff that he did to get some of that information out there, you know, um, uh, with what he did with Golden Dawn, whatever, I'm, I'm grateful of that. But he always seemed to struggle with this kind of libertarian on one side, but courting the kind of uh desire for the traditionalist and you know aristocratic thing on the other which i don't have that much time for but I, an amazing individual and i don't think one it's very it's very difficult to struggle with the western tradition of esotericism without being if you're not exceptionally well read and cruelly it's going to be um you're missing out i think you're missing out agreed well extending that a little bit then obviously crowley was uh, the channel or the conduit for the for a kind of the, a philosophy that's usually thought of as transcending in which is the thelemic side of the equation which yeah. is perhaps the more political and social side of it as well or social justice side social side what are your thoughts on on that then uh if you separate it from crowley on the the actual thelemic movement itself yeah i i, I think the how well it aligns with someone that's a spiritual anarchist that has his libertarian kind of principles um i think are very important to me um i really massively appreciate that i think in terms of, I think as has been mentioned by Crowley quite a lot, in terms of his writing, in terms of his positionality on some issues, for example, with regards to uh, egalitarian and therefore somewhat feminist principles, that's there in the work. Was it there in his, his <laughs> life and how he actually was as an individual? No, I don't think his actions, uh, unfortunately, 
you know, is very much a product of his time to, to a certain degree um, to try and be generous. And even beyond that, he definitely misstepped in the putting those actions, uh, those principles into action. Um, but I think in the work itself and how egalitarian it is and 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 the, the focus on, on individual sovereignty and, and stuff like that, I, I have a lot of time for, yeah. And you, you say feminists as well. Well, it, I, I said feminist in as much as it's egalitarian. Yeah. And how, how that assists the feminist cause, you know? Right. Um, I, I don't think he was a feminist, but... Um, uh, but I think some of those ideas that he espoused politically have, I think some of that initial work was done by the Hermetic Order, Order of the Golden Dawn, because, uh, you know, we know that they, one of their, you know, one of their uh, uh, reasons for doing that instead of the Masonic work was about sort of bringing in, and they did bring in these incredibly powerful women who even, to this day aren't as recognized as they should be but we're starting to see that turn but the point is that they were there in the milieu and they were brought into the work and, and that was valuable and i do think Thalema helped continue that on uh, and some of the kind of like core ideas definitely have been helpful in that ideologically if not always put into practice as well as they should be <laughs> what is i suppose <laughs> Um, okay, look, let's just talk then a little bit about what your your presentation for the symposium, which has this kind of slightly enigmatic title, uh, The Best of All Possible Wills. I must say I kind of misread it at first, as, as you were suspected. The Best of All Possible Wills, I suppose, but wills. It, it's well, so well, it's, tell it's us what that's about without giving too much away and what you're gonna what you're gonna do. I mean, you misread it because of the the, the punnery involved. It's yeah, a, yeah, an allusion, <laughs> of course, to Leibniz and the best of all possible worlds put forward in Leibniz's Theodicy, um, which has been uh, important for me generally and is important in my practice. The talk that I gave at the last All Culture Conference was about reality shifting um and i was talking there about how because there's a couple of different um ideas in reality shifting some of them use the uh, multiple worlds hypothesis from quantum theory um which i think that it, it's deeply problematic how they try and use that idea i won't go into that massively because people can just go and look at that talk and see me unpack that a little bit more. But what I think is uh, far more valuable is understanding the idea of the actual world, which is the world of our lived experience, versus all forms of possible worlds, which includes the imaginal and the possible futures. You know, this idea of an array of possible worlds that could be, and how a lot of, of modern young magical practitioners are using this very much as a way of conceiving instead of making changes in the world in conformity with their will or whatever they're seeing it as like making a shift between worlds mm. and that's how the change happens i think that's always how i kind of thought about my practice um how it came up in relation to talking about flame and will is just in many conversations that i've had around this slightly uncomfortableness with how these different terms are applied in Thalema between will, true will, and pure will. Mm. Uh, and I think there's some complexity there. Uh, and I've always struggled with true will because of the true with a capital T. <laughs> um, I'm a pragmatist and I struggle with the idea of there being uh, an objective truth or some notion of that um and so i think that, that 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 comes with a lot of baggage but also and, and of course you know it, as 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 other than noted before the, the term true will isn't isn't there in the book of the law right but pure will is um and i have some sympathy for pure will as a concept um except that it raises other issues that I get concerned about and find problematic just around the term purity. 
Mm. And, you know, some of the complexity, very heavily sort of fascistic ideas that can be associated with attempts to... Uh, perfected, the perfected individual. Someone put that to me ages ago. That's a bit of a... Uh, an un unusual, difficult phrase to talk and about so, being perfect. Yeah, so perfectionism, ideas of perfectionism, ideas of purity can have a lot of devastating consequences. So I like to think about it in terms of optimization. Hmm. You know, and if you're there with, uh, uh, well, okay, so pure will is what, 100% will, if we're going to make this like playfully <laughs> simplistic, you know, well, maybe if you're running on 87% will in a particular move that you make, you know, um, is that the perfect? No, but, you know, is 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 that more valuable than being 17% in alignment with one's will or whatever? Then yes, it is. And, and so this was a playful idea of going, the idea of optimizing or seeing how how close one can get to one center as a kind of like mapping it rather than this obsession with the absolute again mm. so the, the, the anarchists uh, just want to do what they want which is i think why not well, do what you want well <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean it, it's not do it, again this echoes in some of the ideas in crowley with regards to uh, tolerance, you know, infinitely tolerant, save of intolerance, this this thing. And of course, many other philosophical thinkers have uh, worded um, similar ideas around liberty, that people should have the liberty to do whatever they want up until the point that it imposes on the liberty of, of another individual. And I think that this is a very good benchmark for political engagement. Um, the problem that we have is because I've, you know, been in the activist scene and in the free party scene and in the squatting scenes and stuff like that, is that there are different types of libertarians. There are people who are only concerned about personal liberty in terms of what they can get out of it. Mm. And they, they are libertarians, but they also take liberties, you know, and they have a wake of chaos and they want everyone to pick up after them. Uh, and so I, I, I personally find that kind of behavior deeply, deeply irritating and problematic. And I'm very much of the school of anarchism where it's not about, you, you know, having people to have the freedom. It's just doing whatever they want um, if it isn't having that impact on other people's liberty and freedom. And, and it's having that impact because they're not taking... Uh, their freedom with a responsibility and the, the, the responsibility side often gets um, overlooked, but not by good anarchists that are, that are you know, um, mm -hmm. more informed and living better. So I, I think... We assume you're a, you're a good uh, anarchist. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, 93% I, anarchy. I'm 93% and excellent. Hey, we better not say too much more because it's good. You yeah, know? no, I mean, actually, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, uh, we won't say this too much. This is great. More. So we won't repeat that, but uh, it gives you a good idea for that's, what that's, you're doing. That's, that, I mean, that's, that's some of my more peripheral ideas about it. There's yeah. one, I mean, when I first talked to Seth about me wanting to do this, I was like, is it outrageous to do something huh. that's considered so back to basics? Yeah. But actually, you know, I think uh, um, actually sometimes it's good to go to the fundamentals and back to basics. Yeah, no, those, those core ideas. I've never gone away. <laughs> <laughs> never go further than the basics. No, I mean, what, okay, I said, so. what I said in that, that, that ramble wasn't specifically anything that's going to be directly in the oh, right, okay. Although it, although it will all relate and weave. It will relate to what you can talk about. Weave, yeah. Okay, can you, so to so round us off, uh, can you just tell us what you're doing next after the show? <laughs> oh, gosh, what I'm doing next? What's the new project? New project. Uh, well, there's another event. Sorry. <laughs> there's, a lot happening. there's a lot happening in Cavern World. I've been a little... Um, Are you doing more trans states things? Yeah, so that's something I'm going to have to... So I've been a little removed. I had uh, about a very serious chronic illness. Oh, right. uh, that was triggered um, during the pandemic when I first got COVID. Um, so I've had any uh, chronic okay. fatigue syndrome my whole life, uh, but I had spent nine years being completely recovered from that. Um, 
until I got COVID for the first time. And then it went back to um, being horrifically uh, uh, prevalent. It, it was, it was, it was disabling, utterly disabling. And so, so um, I've been keeping things going in the background, but I haven't been, I've been quite prolific before and doing quite a lot of work. And I haven't been able to put out quite as much as I had previously. But none of it's forgotten. Um, it's all still happening. There will be another trans states, 100%, without any shadow of a doubt. There is also quite a lot of published works coming mm. from the last two trans states. Actually launching uh, an online peer-reviewed journal. Um, so that's happening. I just completed a personal art project which took over a year. Um, so that's come to uh, a culmination and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that and maybe exhibiting it and stuff. I'm sort of still on the, the speaking circuit, although I've been speaking less, so there'll be some of that coming up. But yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back to work. I'm looking forward to the next sort of uh, trans states um happening in, in in the near future and also getting back to my own personal artistic practice i have some films that were in pre-production um that got shelved for a little while um so some writing projects and some some films that are going to be forthcoming as well and, and not too okay. distant future. well i was just say i'm looking forward to lots of that especially the trans states and the the artistic stuff so uh um, just remains to me to say uh, thank you for appearing and do what thou wilt. She'll be the hold of the law and love and the will. Okay, thank you.